Now, as a church, Life Church, we're in the early stages of exploring together what we think God's calling us to as a community. Can we put up the vision slide? Because we have, we think that we're here in this town to be a life-giving people who are the most prayerful, generous, and courageous that we can be. The, is it coming? We're a life-giving people who are here to be the most prayerful, generous, and courageous we can be. And we didn't just pluck this out of the sky. We felt the Lord really impressed this upon us. This is what we're here for. A couple of weeks ago, Ross laid out for us a vision of what it means to be prayerful. Not just that we say prayers, but that we're a patient people committed to God, seeking Him and His will in our lives and making room for what He wants to do. And we have a vision to run prayer retreats here and are seeking God for what that would look like to invite people to come to Seaford to seek the presence of God. But today I want to talk about this idea that we're here to be the most generous we can be. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we want to test that statement. Is it more blessed to give than to receive? We want to learn as a people to imitate the one who is rich in mercy. On your car, on your seats, you have a card that says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And actually, we were praying this morning, we felt to pray against deception, that we can be easily deceived. And so I looked up um, where that word deception appears in the Bible, and I thought it might be interesting, just, it's interesting to note that in James 1, verse 16, this is what it says. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought forth the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Don't be deceived. Every good thing in your life comes from a faithful God. When I was... Uh, went through a period in my life where I was in debt. I never forget um, receiving in the post a card with 300 pounds cash randomly, anonymously from someone who uh, I didn't know with the Bible verse, James 1 verse 16, 17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. God is faithful. And I have often been blown away by the generosity of the Christian community that is the church. It has been a source of just amazement and joy throughout my life as God has used people like you to be a source of amazing blessing. Um, so I've got my first two cars I received in answer to prayer from the people of God. One was a bit of a banger. Uh, still, every good gift comes from the Father of the Heavenly Lights, even if it costs me a lot of money to fix. For the second one... <laughs> I got a phone call once from a guy in the church and he said, can you come around? We have something to give you. And um, I thought, like a CD, a book, I don't know what. So I turned up at his house and he said to me, the Lord is giving you a car. He was from Brighton. Uh, he said, the Lord is, he was from Nigeria. It's my African accent. Sorry about that. He said, the Lord is giving you a car. Is sitting outside on the drive. And I thought, what? Apparently, when I went to visit them a few weeks before, as I drove away, this guy said he felt the Lord speak to him and say, buy Jez a car. And, um, and so he did. He thought, I'm not going to, he said, I'm not just going to buy him a banger, I'll buy him a nice car. He said, I thought we'd spend a thousand pounds on a car for you. So we found a car in London and we, we went up to pick it up. And he said, as I was about to pay the guy for the car, the guy said, I'm a Christian and I feel the Lord tell me to give you this car for free. And so he didn't pay a thousand pounds. He got a free car, came home and said to me, the Lord's given you a car. I was like, great, Honda Civic 1.8. Um, <laughs> I was very grateful. And I think, I think the word generosity can be used to sum up what essentially the Christian message is about. Christianity is about the generosity of God. And therefore, a stingy Christian ought to be like an oxymoron, like cold fire or hot ice. It just doesn't belong together. 
the very heart of the Christian message is that for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave the most precious thing he could to humanity, a humanity that had treated him appallingly. Christianity is about the generosity of God. I want us to imagine what it would look like for a church in this town for us to be the most generous that we could be. See, we have a vision that over the next 10 years we can give away hundreds of thousands of pounds both locally and internationally, to provide relief from poverty, to encourage church planters, and to support the persecuted church where we can. Hundreds of thousands of pounds. We've never done that before, but we feel God has birthed a vision in our hearts for that. We have a vision to turn this building into a home for the town where people can come to find love and acceptance, prayer and purpose. We have a vision to host an annual free-to-all festival incurring cost to ourselves to bring the community together to provide times for relief for family fun in fact we want to turn our um, we've been doing up until now an annual picnic and volleyball day every summer at chinkton we want to turn that from just an annual volleyball day into ching fest good title chinkton festival so if if you're gifted in making things like that come to life come and speak to me but we have a vision to offer regular free meals to the community, providing community belonging and joy and laughter to people who would otherwise perhaps be lonely or shut in. The psalmist says that God places the lonely in families. We want to provide a, an application for that. Last Saturday, we had a, a community dinner here, the first of, first of its kind, and 80 of us gathered round tables for dinner, uh, and it was just a beautiful for me, vision of what I think God's calling us to in the future. I want us to imagine a church that's so generous, no one ever leaves lonely. But every Sunday, he feels embraced and brought into the family. Imagine a community of people where men and women become mothers and fathers to nurture and encourage one another. We are, all of us, crying out for people to invest in us, to nurture us. Our young people especially, as we've heard this morning, crying out for people to say, I want to love these individuals and with generosity pour my gifts and things that I've got into them. Imagine being part of a people so generous that we can do things like that, known for our generosity and hospitality. I love what's going on with our cafe, commercial cafe, Tuesday and Wednesday here, but the, the team that are running this are just doing an outstanding job of increasing and in creating this place of hospitality and warmth such that I, I heard of one mum who's not part of the town, not part of the church, uh, she's not part of the church. She comes to the, the mums and toddler group here, but before she comes in here, goes in there to the cafe, and she says that her little son doesn't want to go to the toddler group. Just what she says, I just want, my son just wants to stay here with Deborah. That is what, they, what he said. But, but Joe, Deborah, Gintari, the way I sit there and watch as they just sweep up these mums, and well, not just mums, but anyone who comes and encourages them, it's beautiful. It's what God's calling us to. I heard of someone turning up to the cafe the other week in, in need and so being taken into a side room and just having someone love them and pray for them. Beautiful. A generous people is a people where everyone knows that they've got something to offer and then offers it because you have all got gifts. And generosity begins then by recognizing the gifts that God has given you. It begins by recognizing the gifts that God has given you and then it, it carries on by helping others to recognize their gift as well. Imagine being in a people who offer their skills to others for free in a kind of emergency DIY SOS that goes on all year round, whether it's building gifts or business coaching or befriending or counseling or cooking or childminding or other things be not always beginning with C. Um, when we imagine those things, we're starting to imagine what it looks like to be the most generous church that we can be. And one day, you see, we won't need to imagine because we'll be it. I mean, if I'd have stood here 10 years ago and said, imagine a church of uh, this size with its own building in the town, the group of 30 or 40 of us would have looked and gone, I can imagine it, but it's unlikely, isn't it? And yet God did it. He does it. And he's speaking to us about what he's calling us to be. To be the most generous we can be, you see, involves our time, involves our energy, it involves our words, it involves our forgiveness. A generous church is a church that forgives. And when I say forgives, I don't mean brushes awkward things under the carpet and does the British thing where we just think, I'm never going to talk about it. 
Forgiveness means acknowledging I was done pain, but I forgive you. That's generosity. Forgiveness involves, oh, sorry, generosity involves our finance. It involves using uh, whatever we have, our home, our woodland, as in the case of the bonfire and barbecue the other week. I love what God said to Moses. What is in your hand, Moses? And he used what was in his hand to perform great miracles. Generosity looks like using whatever God puts in you, your hands, for the good of others. Now, in the time that we've got left, I want to soak us in some Bible verses, and I want to offer just some practical tips then of how I think we can take steps, tentative steps towards becoming the most generous people we can be. Let's soak ourselves, marinate ourselves in some Bible verses. The early Christians were known for their generosity. The book of Acts says that there was not a needy person among them. And listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is what it says. And now, brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul writes, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the churches in Greece. In the midst of a very severe trial, in the midst of a very severe trial, it's worth repeating, isn't it? Like a pandemic. Um, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, extreme poverty welled up to rich generosity. Extreme poverty is not the opposite of generosity. Generosity is not to do with the amount someone gives. Next slide. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the Lord's people. Being generous also involves essentially imitating God. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says this, next slide. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's how people operate, isn't it? I'll only get, I'll, you know, we get even when someone does us wrong. Or we'll only give to someone who's given to us. Proportionality. That's how the world operates. Tit for tat. But Jesus, that's essentially what he's saying. You've heard it said, but I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Next slide. And if anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He's talking about generosity in the way that we behave. Next slide. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is generosity. So that, and here it is, you may be sons or daughters of your father who is in heaven. Four, he makes his, he, God, makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Although mainly on the just, because the unjust steal the just's umbrella. But that's a different point. Imitate your father who is rich in his generosity, who shows kindness to all. That's what we're called to. You want to be like God, Jesus says? Give to people who don't deserve it. Generosity is the heartbeat of Christianity. As we mentioned last week in John 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you so you can come to where I am. Generously offers that to us. John 15, verse 15 to 16, Jesus says this, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I've called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Jesus is generous with the will of God and revelation about what everything I heard from my Father, I've made known to you. He's not like, I've just told you what you needed to get the job done. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Generosity. Again, next one, Titus 3. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And then lastly, James 1 verse 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God is rich in mercy. Psalm 23 says he is pursuing people pursuing us with goodness and mercy. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then the crest on the wave of God's generosity, as we've said, it's James 1 verse 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. Christianity is essentially a movement of generosity. The early church was known for being people who, A, had been with Jesus, 
and therefore B, shared all they had in common. That's soaking ourselves in some Bible verses. Now I want to come on in the last minutes we've got to look at how we can become the most generous people. What steps can we take? And I couldn't think of a better acronym than this. We've got to learn to be those who plate up. There we go. Plate up, as in buy 30 pizzas instead of 13. Plate up. Um, P stands for practices. There we go. You want to be generous, you have to practice giving regularly and sacrificially or painfully out of what God's given you. It's not about an amount that you have to give. Some of the most generous people I know aren't necessarily the wealthiest individuals, but their generosity is just extraordinary. Often, actually, the wealthier someone is, the less generous they can be. Or they might give a lot away, but proportionally it's less sacrificial and painful, just a thought. Now, as a church, we are committing to do this. It's not like you must do this. It's we are committing to do this, which means that we are wanting to just establish the way that we, I don't know, plan and pray about our finances. We're wanting to set up larger generosity funds where we can just give more away to people than we've done previously. But it's also something that we as individuals need to practice. And this is arguably the most radical thing that we can do in a society like this. In a society that essentially is built on like, premises of greed and individual empire building. That's what capitalism is, isn't it? My friend who's uh, an industrial relations expert, he said that um, the Protestant revolution was one that essentially taught people to work for the glory of God. But the capitalist revolution was a revolution that taught people to work for the glory of self. That's what we do. We work for the glory of self. So the most radical, subversive, countercultural thing that you and I can do is to give sacrificially, regularly. We want to be those who learn the joy of giving regularly and sacrificially. And I'm on this journey too. Um, and this is important for us because the, you have an enemy and there is a God of wealth at work in the world, the God of mammon, Jesus calls him. And every time you're given a pay packet of some kind, he whispers in your ear, and he whispers to you saying, this is where security is. This is where joy is. And so we pursue it. I want, I want to do an extension on my house. I need a bigger, better car. Those things aren't bad. You know, I want, I want, I want, I want. And though not bad, the whisper that gets in is, you can trust me for your security more than you can trust God. Now, last week I even confessed at the end of, at the, end of the service. I confessed I struggle with a fear of poverty and a fear of lack struggle to trust God. I'm on this journey. And it strikes me that the, uh, many people in the West do have this f- mentality of lack, that there's not going to be enough. And it just strikes me that that's, that's odd, considering that we are the wealthiest, healthiest people that have existed on planet Earth and are in the top 5% wealthiest people on the planet. And yet we live with this fear of lack. Just submit that to you as a, isn't that curious? We have a God who whispers, the God of mammon whispers and says, you need wealth to be happy to be secure. So every time, every time you give, which is why regularly giving is important, but every time you give, you stick a heart in that mammon God and you crush him and you say, I will not listen to that. I will learn to trust God. And then when you get paid again, mammon comes back to life and he whispers again. And so we kill him again. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's a violent, it's a violent religion that attacks greed and attacks the lies of the enemy like that. If you want to start giving on a Sunday, there's envelopes at the back, you are welcome to do that. We don't talk too much publicly about this, and we don't pass plates around, and we deliberately decided to not do that, because we want people, Christian or not, to come and feel like this, we're not just after your money. But nevertheless, as a Christian, if you're somebody who's wanting to learn to grow in this, giving sacrificially regularly is very important. So again, there's envelopes at the back, you can put the money in the thingy, it's entirely up to you, thingy. That's not ever helped clear instruction, is it? There's a tin pot thing at the back. Okay, fine. Now, it's worth saying as well that the first step towards practicing regular generosity is actually um, learning to manage your money wisely. If you're living chaotically with your money, you can't be generous. In fact, giving generously when your money's in chaos isn't generosity. It's often just recklessness. So we run money management budgeting courses like CAP to help if you're interested. Okay, I need to speed up. So, practice. Next one. 
Generous, generous people who learn to love deeply and hold lightly. Someone shared this with me during the pandemic about just church life. I found it incredibly helpful, so I submit it to you because I think it's useful not just for pastoring, but generally in life. Okay, next slide. We have a quadrant. Everyone loves a quadrant. Um, you have two choices when you meet someone. You can love them deeply or you can love them superficially. You also have the choice. You can hold on to them tightly or you can hold them lightly. And it's not just a question with people, but it's also the question with stuff in your lives. You can love deeply, love superficially, hold tightly, hold lightly. If you love someone deeply and you hold them tightly, don't let them go, that's control. If you love someone superficially, you use them for your own ends, you don't really love them, and you hold them tightly, that's abuse. The goal for the Christian and for me as a pastor, is to love people deeply, but to hold them lightly. You're free to come and go as you please, but you are loved deeply. But I think that also applies to our stuff, the things that God's given you. You love the things in your life deeply, of course, but hold them very lightly. They're just tools in the master's service. We're to be those who have open hands, not grasping ones. Next one. Um, Simply asks you want to be generous you've got to learn firstly to ask god for all that you need jesus says when he taught us to pray he said give us today our daily bread ask every day for the things that you need learning to be generous begins firstly then with seeing that god is the one who meets your needs daily and many of you many of us will be familiar with a man from victorian england george muller who established orphanages in bristol in the 19th century and he did so on the basis really that god answers prayer that God gives whatever we ask him for needs would arise in his life in the needs of the orphanage and he would bring them to God on a daily basis and he would receive answers to those prayers often at the very time of asking this became a pattern throughout his life and his testimony there are stories of sitting down for breakfast with with hundreds of orphans and having no bread no milk no food for them and nevertheless, asking, saying grace, and before grace is finished, there was a knock at the door as the milkman passing by says, my milk float's broken down, have all this milk. Or the baker knocks at the door and says, I've been baking all night because the Lord woke me up to bake bread for the orphans this morning. That was the pattern of his life. He learned to ask God for everything he needed and God gave it to him. But what I discovered recently that really encouraged me was it wasn't just the pattern of his life, it carried on after his life with the orphanage that he established. So he set up the orphanage in, uh, whenever it was, in the mid, uh, mid-19th century. He died in 1898, having led this orphanage for over 50, 60 years, as a testament to the glory of God that God gives when we ask him for things. But then listen to this. Um, he says, yeah, da, da, da. On March the 18th, 1922, this is so, this is now 24 years after George Miller has died and the orphanage has been handed on to the next generation. On March the 18th, 1922, God sent the largest single gift ever to be received in the long history of the work in the form of a donation from the US of $45,000 with a simple statement attached to the money saying, Please accept this t- slight token in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, yours by grace only. Then on the 29th of the same month, another check arrived for $6,000. And then the latest report of the institution was issued in 1939, just as World War II was breaking out. And this report gave the income for the year of 1938-39, showing an income of £34,000. And there was also a balance on hand of £7,124.95. shillings nine and a half pence. Thus, God, it says, the living God, has been able to supply all the needs of the home. The report concluded with this. Without anyone having been personally applied to by us for a donation, £2,369,747, 12 shillings and eight and three quarters pence has been received for the orphans as a result of prayer to God since the work began. When we ask and we pour ourselves on God for his blessing, he gives. We learn to plate up by practicing, by loving deeply, by asking next, by thanking God. Sounds very straightforward, but thanking God for everything in your life loosens your grip on it because you begin to realize 
it all, I, it, was, it all came to me from God. I don't deserve any of it. So we ask God for everything that we need, and then whenever we have something, we thank God for it, and it loosens our grip on things. And then lastly, we, we learn to become a generous people by encouraging each other. See, the opposite of generosity is stinginess. And we want to learn to be those who are generous with our words of praise and our encouragement. We want to be an affirming, life-giving people rather than a nitpicking people. And we want to learn to be generous even with our opinion of those that we disagree with. A friend of mine is excellent at this. He, he debates globally with people that he disagrees with, but often he does so in such a way that you can tell he has a lot of respect for and appreciation for the people that he's debating with. How are you with people that you disagree with or who hold different opinions to you? Now, we live in a very opinionated age. Everyone has an opinion about everything. <laughs> learning to hold opinions lightly, but learning more than that, to speak well of the people we disagree with and see their merits rather than just their flaws is very, very important. It's the grace of God. It's the generosity of God. And if you've ever, if you read the book, the back of the book of James, it says, um, oh, I should read this, it's just, um, yeah, this is amusing. I don't know, amusing, anyway. Um, it says this. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. If you've ever read Job, you've learned that he wasn't the most you know, peaceful, patient type. He was very, you know, up in God's face, wrestling with the trouble that he was facing. And yet God remembers him by saying he was a very steadfast individual. Um, often you see this in the Bible, the, the kind of history of heroes of the faith, it emphasizes them and speaks well of them. It emphasizes their good bits and speaks well of them. God is kind in the way that he remembers you and I. He removes your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. And the way that we're to love one another is to speak well of them. So, there we go. That's how we can learn to plate up. Practice, it's gone. <laughs> Practice giving sacrificially. Loving deeply. Asking God for all that we need. Thanking God for everything. And encouraging one another often. But let's be honest. On the journey to generosity, the hardest challenge that you and I face is the internal challenge. Can we trust God to supply our needs do I, I, we all, if I was to say to you, would you like to be a generous person? Undoubtedly, we'd all say, yes, please. What stops you and I? Fear, lack, not really wanting to get rid of, holding things too tightly. In Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul says, my God will supply every need of yours. Last week, I read about Roland and Heidi Baker who saw remarkable, miraculous provision um, at time, time after time in their lives. You know, to be the most generous people we can be, it requires us to receive from Jesus and then to allow everything that we've received from him to be submitted to him for the adventure he's called us to. In Narnia, the children come across Father Christmas and he gives them gifts, gifts that at the time seem a little unusual, but when submitted to, into the army of Aslan, find a perfect place. All of the gifts that the Lord has given you, he has given you to be used to strengthen and build the community that you're part of, the workplaces that you're part of, the families that you're in. He's inviting you to follow him and to see everything he's given you as a tool in his service to be used on his adventure. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive and I believe he's wanting you and I to discover that to be true. Let's pray.